Alright, alright. She doesn't hook up, then we'll help she hooked up. On this episode of Not Actually Hunting, I'm in Northeast Washington helping my buddy Bart George on a mountain lion hazing study. She's 150 meters from us, 180 meters now. Uh, we're gonna follow along and learn about his the research and the study that he's doing. And the cool thing about it is we get to run hounds that participate and help in this study. What's cool about that is that my dog, Mingus, the blue tick coon hound, got to come along and participate. And so he gets a few more lion tracks under his belt. In the last 10 years, there's been an alarming increase in the number of lion depredations in Northeast Washington. It's hard to say exactly why. As we know with wildlife management, there is never one smoking gun. The human population has increased in these rural areas. Small hobby farms packed with mountain lion snacks have increased in popularity. Mountain lion hunting with hounds was outlawed in Washington in 1996. The mountain lion population could be on the rise. Whatever the reason, when these conflicts happen, mountain lions are the losers. I am uh, Dave Spurbeck. I'm a Fish and Wildlife Officer for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and specifically my area within Spokane County is the northwest area. How often now are you rolling into like a, a dead uh, cat or dog or livestock or something? <laughs> in Spokane County, it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I could put a number on it. And I know you can't like point a finger at one certain thing, but just anecdotally, do you guys, do you feel like, I, mean, I guess you can speak personally or speak, you know, from an agency's point of view as to like what's causing the uptick? There's definitely an increase of people. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely an increase um, in little hobby farms. Um, there's definitely, uh, since we got rid of hounds, there's less effective ways to control the numbers. Um, I think all of those things cannot be disputed. Coincidentally, states that allow hound hunting have few problems with lions. States that have outlawed hound hunting, like Washington, Oregon, and California, are experiencing record levels of depredation. A depredation is when a lion, or any predator for that matter, injures or kills livestock or any human-owned animal. When the lion kills its normal prey, like a deer, it's simply called a predation. 2018 was the height of cougar depredations in Northeast Washington. The people of Stevens and Ferry counties felt like they were not being heard by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, so they asked the sheriff to do something about it. The sheriff created Jeff Flood's position. My main thing is predators, wolves, cougars, black bears, and that type of work, conflict work. I was hired to enhance and protect local agriculture. Do you know how many uh, depredation calls you take annually now? Uh, no, I couldn't even count them in my head. Lots, lots though, you know. Almost daily? Daily. If we deem that it is, you know, a bad cat, you know, killing people, sheep or goats or that kind of stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. And is it like a uh, two strikes, you're out kind of a deal, or can it be just like one kill and one? Because you know, yep. one, there's gonna be more. And likely it's been, you know, you can't say they've killed others, but yeah. chances are they have. So, you know, with the population of mountain lions that we have here, you know, I'm not here to say, oh, you're not gonna hurt them, but we're not gonna hurt them, you know. So we're gonna we're gonna remove them. We want to err on the side of caution. You know, we don't want a kid to get attacked or bit or any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel like there's a correlation between the the lack of hound hunting and the and the increase in lion population? I do, I do. I think there's a, a correlation there. But you know, there's a correlation in how many depredations we have. I talked to the enforcement guys that were here when we hound hunted. And I asked them, what was a busy year for depredations? And they'd say, well, if we killed three cats in a year, that's a busy year. Now we're and pushing. And that's for this Tri-County yeah. area? Now we're pushing, you know, 60 cats a year doing it out of. And you look at our boot hunters are killing cats. We're getting cats run over on the road. All these cats were collaring. And then 
all the cats that the state has collared, you know, we got a huge population of cats. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're yeah. going to have trouble, you know. Maybe some of the reason we didn't have all the trouble before is we were running them with dogs. You know, if I drew a lion tag or you drew a lion tag back when we could hound hunt, we would run out and we'd hunt all, all season and mm -hmm. kill our cat the last week. We'd run lions all the time. These cats, I thought, had a, felt had a little more respect for humans, you know, the pickup, the sound of us, the dogs, you yeah. know. Now these cats aren't afraid and they've been raised down close. They've come into town and they've whipped, you know, a house dog, an old cow dog off, you know, now. We, we catch cats on the ground now, bay them up on the ground like a bear. And that never happened before. And I think, I think that's because they had some fear of the dogs, you know. Sure. We may tree them and harass them a little bit and then go and run another cat and go run another cat and, and we conditioned them a little. Concurrent with Flood being hired, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife director wrote a memo that basically said that any problem cougar could be killed. This gave the wardens and contracted hound handlers like Bruce solid direction. Unfortunately, this resulted in lots of depredating lion removals. How, how many years have you uh, worked hounds and chased lions? Um, 51. 51 years. So how many cats do you think in 50 some years have you treed? Treed? Probably at least 1,500 that I've seen in a tree. Because in the last Five years, there's been over 300 just depredations. Between 2018 and 2021, Bart, Bruce, and Jeff were involved in 143 recorded lion removals in the four counties that make up Northeast Washington. The reason the project got started was because Northeast Washington has seen an increase in like cougar activity and cougar depredations. Typically when there's a depredation, uh, livestock or pet or something like that, uh, the cat's removed. When it's an agency removal, they call a hound handler typically, come out, we run and capture that cat in a tree, they kill it, and those cats go to the dump. It got to be where there was just in this region, you know, 50 and 60 cats a year being disposed of that way. So we came up with this study designed to kind of haze cats, and it's something we've been doing but we didn't know, it just begged the question, like, does it even work? And the study design then kind of morphed into this thing where we want to see if cats can make an association, not with the location, but with an association to some stimuli. In this case, human voice. So we approach the cat and grab the distance, you know, whatever, anywhere typically from 10 yards out to about 150 yards. When that cat's listening to us approach, we want to know how tolerant is it of our you know, presence in this human voice stimuli and how afraid is it. And you know, the way we kind of measure that is how much energy is it willing to expend to get away from us. I know it's early in the uh, study because you still got a year to go and you've got like what, roughly 40 cats that you've Hazed for four weeks or so? Yeah, I think we've got complete data on like, this will be 33, I think. Are you seeing any early trends that you can, that you think that like, what the hazing, what the reaction is to the hazing? We are, um, we are definitely seeing some trends. You know, it's still a little bit early. I haven't really dug through all of the data, but it's trending towards an increase in distance. The cats. We're, we're reasonably sure at this point we can say they are making an association. They understand that that stimuli leads to this negative interaction. Depredations are done mostly by adult lions. Kittens are sometimes found with the adult females at the depredation site, but they're not the ones doing the killing. They just come for the meal. All right, let's break down how this works. First, the team turns on the cat's collar. That female is actually right at the Boy Scout summer camp. That'd be a good one probably to chase out of there. Once located, Bart and I start hiking towards the lion. I'll let you know when she moves. All right, thanks. Next, and you're not going to believe this, uh, but we use the Meteor Podcast as and, the stimuli. And those markets and, and build, you know, Sam Lundgren, their, everybody. Their fishery. <laughs> and Bruce and Jeff light. stay back watching the action unfold on the GPS. So that's Bart and Giannis right there coming in. And she's just sitting right there. 
Once we bump the lion and Bart gets his data points, then Bruce and Jeff will cut the dog loose to do their job. So it's interesting that you'd say, like, no, our sovereign, and I know 200 Canada, yards from like, we're going to have to get off our the trail sovereign nation, and break our tribe, over that is way. in it, whatever, I don't know if it's every year, every two years, whatever. They need to come to an agreement, like, okay, how big is the pond? Cut it in half. For 58 yards. 50% from... for tribal harvest, 50% 58 for, yards. for non indigenous. So that plays out across salmon, steelhead. Just trying to reduce the, the catch rate. But, so right now we're know, 40 right yards now. from a mountain lion that hasn't spooked yet and we're playing the Meteor podcast at 80 decibels. She's like right here. Um, and catch and release does count as take uh, un, un, under some re more recent court decisions. Um, but you know, the, 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 it, it, it's harder, harder mathematics now that the, you know, a lot of these steelhead runs are like under a thousand and the tribe still assured it and they're 50% take still showing trees on a very small kind of escapement um, but edge. you know it's it's, it's the math is a little the math is pretty fuzzy yeah um, because it's you know it's gill nets and stuff and it's like you get these days a week estimating how many you're going to get um, yeah, it's you know I, to me brushy. it's important um, that they still by. have that the right to do that and maintain well, those you know traditions but on the other side of the coin like <laughs> and some of the tribes are totally at the table here like hey there's a problem we're trying to fix it we're um, and are working with WDFW and the I other stakeholders to, to address all those tree. problems. I just but don't, I don't then there's, go there's some other tribes who are like, go pound sand, look at the bolt decision She's we have pretty the right comfortable. to do. Yeah, I think that's one of the areas where there's a lot of frustration would be that She's probably comfortable exercising so fit, tribal rights. Right? Yeah. Well, look where she lives. She takes precedent over walking sort of like up and down this road the and talking the to their dogs and talking yeah. to And at a point, it gets into the finger pointing. It's like, well, the resource wouldn't be screwed up if it weren't for you guys. Right. So it's like, okay. Yards anymore. But it's still screwed up. It was white men that put canneries feet. on the mouths of all those rivers, you know, 80, 100 yeah. years ago. And, so and all that's true. And it's tricky. No, it's tricky as hell. You want a good segue? Yeah, please. This connects Washington She's with right Canada. Canada. Great. Trees. Phenomenal. So this was another uh, Canadian Supreme Court they, case that was just decided. Um, in 2010, Rick DeSwattel of Washington trees. State, he lives on the uh, Confederated Colville the Reservation north of yeah, Spokane. 70 feet crossed so up 20, into bc yards. and killed an elk mountain lions are not known for attacking people but when we get to less than 20 yards of this lion bart unholsters his bear spray yes even a lion professional considers this close and then when told the game warden hmm. hey I, I killed this elk and i'm exer i'm uh, exerting my Oh, well, treaty right. international boundary yeah he's a member of the cynix tribe or the arrow lakes people that were 37 feet no oh, 12 yards she was right in that little patch of trees she was probably gonna day up in the shade right there be my right. guess can you tell which way she went yeah she's going that way um so let's get our stuff together she's still only 55 yards she's not running away she's walking away which is one of the measurements on I'm collecting that data too. Like whether they run or walk. Yeah, if they just kind of saunter away, and that's a different thing than like scrambling up that scree slope, you know. But now this cat has been collared but not hazed. This is her first time, so she doesn't really know what's about to happen. Right. So that like the fact that we got close and the fact that she's That's not a surprise. Right. This yeah. is what you kind of would expect. Right? Yeah, that's not a surprise. 195 meters which i don't know what to ex i mean females tend to be a little more skittish this cat let us get quite close um she might travel you know a few hundred yards here even though we didn't really do anything um we put jog but again i mean this cat has seen and heard people all its life we've just sitting on that road, we saw, what, half a dozen people come walking by. So when she stops, I will grab that. And that's kind of the last piece of data that I need to grab before we can start hazing. At this point, the hounds are released to treat the cat. Usually a short chase because, Rambo, let's go. well, you can imagine Rambo. why. That cat was just sitting around in this stuff out of the day, I suppose. But this cat is different. She stays on the ground and keeps out maneuvering the house. The dogs are off the track by 80 yards though. I'm not sure what's happened up there. 
on a usual hazing run. After the hounds have treed the cat, they are taken back to the truck. It's then left alone until the hazing is repeated a week later. Yeah, we're gonna have a hard time in here. Collar probably came off. <laughs> oh, shit! Get him, get him, get him! For whatever reason, this lion does not want to tree, and the chase has gone on long enough, especially in this heat. To continue would be bad for the cat and bad for the dogs. Before GPS collars, it was widely believed that once jumped, the cats climbed the nearest tree. Bruce now knows otherwise. Before having these collared cats, what did you think the cats were doing at the end of the race? Just climbing a tree. Like when they heard the dogs, it sounded like the dogs would just jump them and locate them and tree them. Mm -hmm. But they do a lot of evasive maneuvers at the end. And that's why you'd be, you'd hear a race, and you'd think they jumped it, and then they'd get quiet for a little bit, and you think they're trying to locate a tree, but they're actually trying to figure out where it went. Maneuvers, like explain the maneuvers. Like, just where, trying where does to get away, like do? a figure eight, go back in on their tracks, do out and back. And when we're close enough to the dogs that you'd think the dogs should see them. On the Garmin, it's like they're like side by side, one's going one way, one's going the other. But they, for whatever reason, don't see them, and they have to try to work the track out. Can you speculate at all as to why the cat's doing that? It has, it would almost, with these cats, it would have to be something. It's not, it, I wouldn't think it would be learned because they've never been chased before, most of them. Probably all of them, other than a farm dog chasing them away from a ranch. Mm -hmm. It would just be something in, that they've developed. It's just instinctual. It would have to be, I think. But they're just trying to evade something versus just jump right, right into it. Right, rather tree. than jump and spend the life in the tree, they try to get away from it. And maybe it works often enough, and that's why they yeah. keep doing it. I wanted to hear from a local, one that has been directly affected by a lion. The Bartons are the owners of Barton Farms, which produce alfalfa and dairy in the valley. They own numerous livestock, and the farm is literally in the middle of lion country. The farm has been in the family for 27 years, so they're bound to have a couple of stories to share. Yeah, I've run across them several times up there. Um, I've snuck up on one one time, and he was laying there looking over the valley on some rocks, and so I got to stay there and, and watch him for a few minutes before I ran off. And another time I had one uh, actually come towards me, and I called out to her, and then she, she left. So, yeah, I've run into him quite a few times. Have you ever had any animals uh, taken or eaten or killed by a mountain lion? Yes, we did. We had one um, a sheep named Dolly killed back here along the rock slide. I used to let my sheep out every spring up on this hill to help eat the weeds down. And we'd bring them back in in the evenings. And then I noticed that there was a sheep missing. And I figured it was probably a cougar. And I took the dogs out in the evening and we, they, they were able to find the carcass. And it was partially covered under some in some thick brush mm -hmm. so we came back and called called the game department are you guys as i guess as a family and a, and a ranch are you guys like pretty happy sharing the landscape with mountain lions or sort of how do you look at your relationship with them well when i first moved here about 27 years ago i thought it was really neat but now i cannot turn my sheep on the hill anymore because there's just so many cougar that even in the daytime that i i can't be assured that I'm not going to You feel like attack. there's more now than there were oh, when you got here. Oh, there's definitely more now. There's just way too many cougar. I mean, it's clear. So if they, if, if they could do, I don't know what they would, would do about that, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's just clear that we're, there's a lot more encounters, a lot more sign, a lot more problems with cougars. We don't go on the mountain without our dogs just so we have a, like a first alert. Yeah. You know, like it gives us a little bit extra time and sense that mm -hmm. there's something there. So other than that, I don't, I don't feel like there's, there any threat to us necessarily. Yeah, I think it's neat having them up there. Yeah. In place. Yeah. You guys are more than just a, the normal hobby farm out here, right? And I appreciate that you guys recognize cougars on the landscape and respect them and want them around. Um, I also understand you guys need to make a living off of these animals and don't want them getting wiped out. Right. Yeah, it's the ones that are bold enough to come this close that are perusing the fence line that you know that's the ones you're thinking okay there's there needs to be something done enter bart george the Calspell tribe and their research has, has this cat been sh what what's the what's his data points been showing as you you know the first time was pretty unnerving the first time he let us get quite close 
he has been better. I think last time was about 100 meters we got, but he travels once we bump him. He's been, he's been moving a little bit. So we're 400 yards now. Technology finds people with the right skills and experience for your job. And this cat probably knows your guys' voices by now. We're going to walk up this trail to him, I think. This is the last hazing session Bart and the team will do on this tom. The plan is to tree him and remove the collar. He's moving. So how far were we from it when we bumped? About 90 yards. That's spooky. That's what that is. Really, it makes you wonder how many cats you've walked past. Coming your way. Copy. Yeah, I hear him kind of. Come on, girls. Come here, girls. Hey, 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 hey. Come here. Come on, girls. Hey, they're on it. The dogs make quick work of this tom, treeing him in a matter of minutes. The cat has climbed high into the tree. In order to get a clear shooting lane for the dart gun, which administers the sedative, Jeff has to climb into the tree with the line. In the meantime, we clear the area around the base and rig a tarp to catch the lion when it falls. This team is a professional, well-oiled machine. The utmost care is taken to ensure the cat's safety, and Bart is proud of his injury-free record when handling cats. Here we go. Good hit. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh here it comes. He's okay. Landed just right. Okay. So this is cat number 52. And then you can see on the backside, just the tribe's ear tag, you know. Mm -hmm. Do not consume, call first. That's how you can figure out his age is by what? His gum wear? Yeah, so you see this. Yeah, use that little thing to point the drop with the. Yeah. Line and then they're actually right under the gum right there. There's a little ridge, so you can't, it's just underneath the gum right there. And that tells us that the drop is his age or close. Hmm. So you'd measure that in millimeters and then add one yeah. if they have drop. Yeah, so he's like eight, seven or eight probably. And that's old for a mountain lion. Yeah, he's in his prime. Yeah. He's in good shape. Yeah, those paws Seriously. are amazing. When you get to look at one up close, you, get, you realize why you don't see the claws in, when he walks around in the snow. Okay, let's grab his measurements since we're here. Got the data sheet. Yeah, he's going to need a longer uh, tape yeah. measure. Need long. I've been up close and personal with cats before, but only in hunting situations. I can tell you, handling a sleeping lion is a trip. 71. I can't help but keep wondering what happens if this thing wakes up unexpectedly. He's got a pumpkin head. He's big. A lion cannot regulate their own body temperature while sedated, so the team packs in frozen water bottles to keep them cool. After Bart and his team finish taking measurements, he administers the reversal drug to wake him up. Usually after the reversal, I mean, we're right at 50 minutes for that ketamine to metabolize, so um, it might be a little bit slow getting up but um, you'll start seeing those whiskers move in and then you'll start seeing him blink and he'll just lay there and kind of listen and then it seems like to me i don't know bruce you've seen it too but it seems like all of a sudden they just kind of get their bearings and realize what what's happening and usually at that point they look at us and then they bolt it's not exactly clear how to help these lions and how to limit the amount of depredation what is clear is the need for more science and more research Come on now Bart's study is ongoing, and it'll be interesting to see what the data shows in the end. My bet is that the hazed lions keep their distance. I applaud the Kalispell tribe and Bart for their work. This lion has been bothered, some might say harassed, by being part of this study. It's been chased into a tree by hounds four times and handled by humans twice. But it's still wild, and most importantly, it's alive and not lying next to a fast food bag in the bottom of a dumpster.